Hi, I'm Jenny and I'm Evidence and Engagement Officer at West Country Rivers Trust and I'm the Project Officer for Plymouth Riverkeepers. I'm going to give an overview of the project and what we've been working on. Plymouth Riverkeepers is a three-year project which was created following a pollution incident in 2016. A build-up of commercial use wet wipes created a blockage in the sewerage pipe which led to a Category 1 or major pollution incident. The pollution had a substantial impact on the stream, unfortunately killing more than 80 brown trout. As a result, an enforcement undertaking was agreed by the Environment Agency with South West Water. To improve the area, South West Water used this enforcement undertaking to enable West Country Rivers Trust to conduct work to improve the watercourses in the area of the pollution, particularly the Tamerton stream, which led to the creation of Plymouth Riverkeepers. The project area sits in the northwest of Plymouth and falls within the River Tamar management catchment. This map shows the different streams within the project area, all of which flow into Tamerton Lake, which is also known as Ernest Little Creek, and on into the River Tamar. The streams flow through a series of woodlands and built up areas. The different reaches were identified for the purposes of West Country Rivers Trust surveys. West Country Rivers Trust are working on a wide range of surveys and works to improve the area, including various ecological surveys, water quality monitoring, habitat management and farm advice. Community engagement is also a very important part of the project, working to connect people to their local water environment. This includes citizen science and both online and community events. A walkover survey was undertaken in 2017 by our fisheries team and the findings were helped to inform the project work. This map shows where the various types of fisheries habitats are found within the project area. Fisheries habitats need to be healthy and functioning to provide refuge and food for all life stages of fish, to support spawning, nursery areas, feeding and growth to maturity. Therefore, a productive river in terms of its fisheries needs to contain a diversity of habitats. Rivers and streams need an adequate supply of sunlight to support primary production and their complex food web. Heavy shading and tunnelling can therefore impact the in-stream biodiversity. Our 2017 survey found that all of the reaches are overshaded and would benefit from targeted coppicing, and the results of this survey will help us to inform habitat management works. Monthly spot sampling by West Country Rivers Trust staff started in November 2020 over 11 spot sampling sites. Water quality monitoring aims to establish baseline levels of a range of indicators of river health within the streams. To identify, locate and characterise pollution sources, monitor water quality changes throughout the project and engage local communities. A time-lapse camera is set up in the catchment to capture photos every 15 minutes to have visual evidence of how the stream changes with the rainfall events and potentially see pollution. It also has a motion sensor to photograph any wildlife. In the top photo, we see the normal state of the river and the bottom photo is captured after rain and clearly shows a rise in turbidity. Continuous in-situ monitoring began at the same location when a static probe was installed in the catchment. The probe has been very useful already in highlighting continuous changes in the stream. We can see patterns in the conductivity and recognise when it's going above its normal level. The system is set up to send an alert when certain levels are exceeded and this has allowed our local CSI volunteers to take water samples very quickly afterwards to try to help us pinpoint sources of pollution. Spot sampling is coming up to a year when a detailed review will be undertaken by the water monitoring team. These maps show results carried out after an initial six month review. Maps on the left show the various parameters we're testing for, rating each one from higher to lower water quality. And these have been combined in the map on the right to show the overall water quality score. The main issues are coming from high phosphate levels in the streams. And this may indicate issues with misconnections due to a high ratio of optical brightening agents, for example, from laundry detergents. We often experience smells of sewage and grey water during sampling visits. Generally, we find low levels of turbidity and colour and oxygen levels are generally good. 
We detected ammonia for the first time recently, which corresponded to a pollution incident. Our river operations team have begun non-native invasive plant species survey and removal. So far, we have identified Himalayan balsam, winter heliotrope, bamboo, rhododendron, laurel and water fern. We held a community Himalayan balsam removal event in June and we have more to come next year. And we'll be looking at where we can increase productivity by reducing shading along the streams as well as doing some tree planting. And we will involve the local communities with these opportunities. During a site visit earlier this year, we identified a non-native invasive plant species, water fern, on Budshead Pond. Water fern is an introduced ornamental pond plant which has escaped into the wild and it's now one of the UK's most invasive plants. It starts out green and can look similar to duckweed, but over time it turns pink due to its association with nitrogen fixing bacteria, as you can see in the photo. The plant spreads very rapidly, forming a dense mat on the surface of the water. It blocks out light and depletes the water of oxygen, which can harm native wildlife. Bud's Head Pond is home to a vast array of wildlife, including palmate newts, toads and common frog, as well as a large range of invertebrates, including pond snails and dragonfly and damselfly larvae, all of which were likely to be feeling the negative effects of the water fern. Water fern can be difficult to control or remove as it spreads so rapidly. Chemical control wasn't considered to be an option due to the harmful effects on the water environment. Physical control or removing the plant by hand was also not considered to be an option as this can cause it to spread further as the tiny fragments can each grow to form new plants. Instead, to control the water fern, 2,000 North American weevils have been released directly into the pond by the Plymouth River Keepers team. These non-native weevils will not have any harmful effects on our native wildlife. They feed solely on water fern and they cause considerable damage until it sinks and naturally decomposes at the bottom of the pond. Once the weevils have exhausted their food supply of water fern, they will take to their wings and fly off to find the next batch to feed on. Some weevils may overwinter in the pond and will continue their good work next spring, should the water fern come back, and others will naturally die out as they reach the end of their life. We worked with the community, including a local friends group and CSI volunteer to release the weevils. The work was really successful with the weevils clearing the water fern within two months. We installed a fixed point photography post to monitor their progress, asking members of the public to send us photos using a hashtag on social media or via email. The post will stay in place to capture changes throughout the seasons. We've used the photos sent so far from the fixed point photography post to create a time lapse video. In the following video, we can see the pink water fern reducing over time. The increasing green covering that you can see is duckweed. This require good connectivity between different locations to allow access to vital adult, juvenile and breeding habitat. Good access also allows fish to avoid areas that will negatively impact upon them, such as low flows or pollution incidents. A total of over 30 barriers have been identified in the project area by our fisheries team. Urbanisation of the catchment and particularly culverting has created multiple barriers to fish passage. Barriers include man-made structures such as weirs, pipes and culverts, as well as accumulated woody debris and litter. So-called sniffer surveys are an in-depth look at barriers to fish migration, considering passage for a variety of species such as salmon, trout, eels and lamprey. 
Fifteen sites were surveyed in spring in low flow conditions and high flow surveys will be done over this winter. The results will be used to prioritise fish barrier removal or easement works. During the process, many measurements are taken such as head height, flows, depth and transect across the barrier itself. This detailed approach allows us to not only judge individual barriers, but to make an assessment of catchment scale priorities for fish passage solutions. In this example, under the low flow conditions, TS1 is a complete barrier for upstream migration for almost all species and a high impact partial barrier for adult lamprey and juvenile eel. TS2 was far less fav favourable for migration and was scored as a complete barrier to migration due to this section being completely dry and a partial barrier for eel. The minimum legal requirement for this would be an eel pass to be installed. Removal may be possible at this site, but it will require a feasibility study as it has some utilities next to it. The, best, the next best option would be a technical fish pass for all species. Electrofishing surveys took place in September to give us baseline data before we do any barrier works and habitat works. And the surveys will be repeated again in summer 2022 and 2023 after the works. And this will allow us to assess the impact of barriers to fish passage on populations and to inform the effectiveness of the works undertaken. Electrofishing uses a controlled electric current to temporarily immobilise fish to allow them to be counted and assessed, and it is not harmful to fish. It's one of the most accurate methods of assessing fish populations. We undertook semi-quantitative surveys which determine presence, absence, abundance of juveniles and fish sizes. The full assessment is still to come, but initial results indicate a clear link to fish migration barriers. We're working with several farms and landowners in and around the catchment. Our farm advisors have done site visits and are working with the farmers to design interventions to benefit the environment and improve water quality, while also maximising efficiency of their farms. Potential interventions include constructed wetlands, for instance, reed beds, renewing yard concrete and waste management. West Country CSI is our volunteer programme which aims to educate and engage people with the water environment. Riverfly will soon be incorporated into the CSI programme and this looks at river flyers, which are the mayflies, caddisflies and stoneflies. Um, and if you're interested in taking part, please get in touch. We have run a variety of online events, which was particularly helpful for us to connect with local communities during the COVID-19 restrictions. We collaborated with the local CIC, the Conscious Sisters, on their Clankine project to nurture a deeper connection between place and community with online sessions on history, ecology, foraging and art. We're in the process of planning a series of winter webinars, which will be open to all. We've been out and about in the catchment this summer, meeting communities um, at a series of events, and we've engaged with around 350 people over this time. We've also signed up to the local time bank so that people can earn time credits when they volunteer with us. Plymouth River Keepers are working in partnership with preventing plastic pollution uh, in the project area. Globally, about 80% of plastic pollution in the oceans comes from the land and approximately 4 million tonnes of plastic waste enter the ocean via rivers every year. We've held community litter picks and litter surveys and the litter surveys help to inform the PPP project of the types and quantities of litter entering our waterways. So what's next? Um, we'll continue to build our evidence base through surveys and monitoring. And we will continue with practical habitat works and removal or easement of fish migration barriers to improve the streams for fish. Farm interventions will start in the new year and we will continue to build our CSI community and our relationships with the local community, including residents, businesses and schools to empower people to make a positive change. Thanks for listening um, and if you'd like to know more, please get in touch.